extraordinary charities. I think that this is something that was highly needed for our nonprofit community. So I am honored to be here this morning um, with this fundraising power panel. I think I'd like to start off uh, to, with an introduction to our esteemed uh, panelists, and I will start with Sorrel Phillips. Can you give a little bit more information about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Sorrel Phillips here, and um, I'm a partner on, on Dream Team, and I also have my own research business, which is just under Sorrel Phillips when I, I do um, lots of different kinds of research for nonprofits. And I'm the one who led the session on a research that kicked off this whole series. So happy to be here today. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, next, Cheryl Baldwin. Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl Baldwin. Um, I am the brand designer for Dream Team and I work with Laura and Sorrell to create total brand packages for nonprofits and arts organizations. And uh, Laura and I did a session earlier in the series on um, branding and fundraising. So happy to be here today. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, okay, next, Laura Bessinger. Good morning all, such a pleasure to be here today. I am the third member of Dream Team. I am in charge of the aspects of a written brand. So I am the message person, but I also have a big background in fundraising and leading nonprofit organizations. So uh, all my years of experience certainly are poured into our recommendations from our team on how to connect your message to your audience so that you get uh, some action and some following behind it. Excellent, thank you very much. You ladies definitely do make the dream team. Okay, we're going on to achieve. Uh, Meredith Wanna, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here as well. Um, I am the creative director at Achieve. Um, I oversee everything design for uh, our web and marketing work. Um, I work with nonprofits every day um, to, you know, implement their vision um, for their design. Um, and I did the series, the, the session earlier in the series, Website 911, How to Rescue, Rescue Your Website for Fundraising Success. So I'm so glad to be here this morning. Excellent. Thank you, Meredith. And last but not least, Erica. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Linguanti. I'm the Director of Marketing at Achieve. Um, so we're a digital agency for nonprofits. We specialize in website and web support, and then also digital marketing and social media advertising techniques for nonprofits. Um, I work really closely with Meredith all the time. I'm so lucky to work with her. She's a genius when it comes to design, and she really makes everything possible for us. So you guys are lucky to have her here today, because I roped her into this. She doesn't uh, <laughs> always share her secrets, so we're excited to have her. Um, and you know, I love it. I love digital marketing. I've been in the industry over 10 years, worked in luxury hotel space, tech startups, and then for the past few years, nonprofit. So I like putting my skills to good use. Excellent. Thank you very much, Erica. This is definitely a great job putting together a true power panel of uh, ladies in this case. So thank you for organizing this. Um, just really quickly, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, comments, success stories that you'd like to share with us, there's a few options for you to do that. You can either raise your hand and we'll actually unmute you and you can directly interact in, with this panel. If you'd rather, you can also just send a comment on your chat and we'll be monitoring it to make sure that we get to your questions. Um, for anyone that is joining, and this is obviously the final one of this webinar series, but this came about truly because of the pandemic, forcing changes on all of us in the industry. Um, many organizations have had to radically alter their fundraising strategies and rely more heavily than ever on their web and social media presence. So with that, we want to talk about what organizations can do to make a better impression with their supporters on these platforms as we move into end of year fundraising. Can you believe it? Ah, okay. Anyway, so we were sent a few questions over the last couple of weeks, and I think um, we'd like to start with those. Um, Surreal, this first one is for you. How can nonprofits leverage donor research to make their case to supporters? I'll give that to you again, just in case anyone missed it. It's how can nonprofits leverage donor research to make their case to supporters? You're muted. 
Sorry, I had to, my dog was trying to scratch the door so she could get in. Um, it's interesting to me that when, before I joined Dream Team, nonprofits generally didn't consider doing research as a part of their fundraising strategy. And the more and more I worked with Cheryl and Laura, we realized that putting these things, three things together, research, messaging, and, and design for cause-related initiatives was absolutely vital, kind of a missing piece of the landscape. And the reason that um, doing research before doing any kind of a campaign is essential is because it totally helps you inform your messaging. It, it helps you put yourself at top of mind of your potential donors. It reminds them that you're there. Um, you're in your head all day long, every single day, and even your core supporters aren't necessarily thinking of you every single day. So it, it's just a way to kind of trigger that memory. Um, it also shows your donors that you're thinking about them. So if you create a research strategy that engages people in a conversation about what's meaningful to them about what it is that you do, you can better shape your, you know, your campaign message. It also helps you identify um, Maybe certain people are attracted to your cause for very specific reasons that might be different from one another. And that gives you a sense, a, a, a strategy for segmenting your list and maybe creating a couple of different messages that are specific to one aspect of your cause. So it definitely informs, it, it informs your campaign strategy from the very, very beginning. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I just saw Clay posted, but if anyone has questions as these conversations arise, please be sure to raise your hands or include it in the chat box. But thank you very much, Cheryl. Okay, the next question that came is gonna be for Cheryl. What can organizations do to clean up their branding now? Well, that's a really big question. The first thing that I would say to that is to ask themselves, do you even have a brand? Um, if you don't have a brand or feel like you don't have a brand, that is a much bigger question and something that can be worked on. Um, but it's not something that you wanna rush through. If we're talking about, you know, end of year fundraising or an event or something that you're trying to get information out there and make sure it's branded, um, then you're gonna just need to work with what you need to work with. Um, so I would say things like definitely simplify, um, make sure that you're using appropriate colors, appropriate graphic images, um, make sure that you're not worried about visually and messaging wise, throwing everything about your organization into whatever piece or event that you're trying to get out there. Be very focused and very specific and simplify. Um, we want to make it easy for people to understand what you want them to do. Do you want them to donate? Do you want them to attend your event? Do you want them to, you know, um, spread awareness on social media? So make your call to action really, really simple. Um, so the brand overall is such a big deal. If you're not happy with your brand, meaning your logo, your color palette, hopefully most of you guys have some um, brand standards in place that you can just easily translate that into whatever you're doing. But if you don't work with what you have, simplify, simplify, simplify. That's amazing advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Simple but concrete. Uh -huh, I'm percent I agree. Um, the next question is going to be for you, Laura. What is your advice to nonprofits to help them stay on message? Ooh, uh, oh, that's like the best question you could ask because I think that um, we can address it by summarizing this very tried and true process that our team has worked with for a long time and, and time and time again, it, it has seen success in helping people get a truer message more consistently. And that is one, one of our greatest beliefs. And when we work with clients closely, um, we concentrate on talking to your higher purpose. 
And a lot of times organizations might believe they're already speaking that language or they really know, hey, we've got a lot of discovery due to, to do to help distinguish our voice and, and really um, speak to our higher purpose all the time. And um, so how do you do that? The biggest way to start finding your higher purpose is to get very clear about what your cause is and start thinking about yourself as a cause, talking about yourself as a cause, and then to really understand your own belief systems. That's your culture. So what is it that you value in the way you meet this need and you provide this service? And so this becomes your cause. If we think about talking about why we exist, why we're here to serve, as opposed to talking about ourselves as a list of programs or just introducing ourselves as the programs we provide. If we connect with people on that human cause related platform, then you start to build believers. So the best thing you can do to stay on message is to talk about yourself as a cause and about your beliefs. That is what people connect to and that is why they're going to want to support your programs. It's like any great brand that you might have, you know, an affection for a certain type of car you drive or a certain restaurant you frequent or the clothes you buy. It's a statement about you and the way you want to be seen and portrayed and what you value. It's the same thing with your nonprofit cause. Why should people value you and want to be a part of you? So find your higher purpose and speak, speak to it. Absolutely love it. It's so personal, even just hearing you talk about it. It's beautiful. So thank you very much. Okay, our next question is going to be for you, Meredith. What is the most important thing that organizations can do to their website now to make an impact this fall? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I think this just goes back to really some of the basic principles that, you know, um, is always important to the success of a website. Um, and, you know, I guess my, my, my first thing I always go to is um, if you're looking at your website or better yet, if you can have someone else maybe who's not as close to your website um, and maybe even organization, um, take a look at it and ask them if they understand what your website is about, what your organization is about. Um, you know, I think that's really, you know, the, the, the foundation for, you know, a successful website. Um, you know, we know that people only spend about, you know, tops 15 seconds per page. So if you're going to expect them to do a lot of like, you know, you know, if they're not going to crack a book and start at sentence one and read from top to bottom, they're really going to look at it um, in, in more of a way of like scanning your page. They're going to look for navigation to see if it's ambiguous. Can they understand from, you know, the way your menu is labeled? Um, that's that helps, you know, uh, website visitors quickly understand just from a top level down. Um, and then can they scan? Um, you know, are they required to do a lot of reading to understand, um, you know, again, what your site is about and who your organization is about. Um, I would say also during this season, I mean, we have, you know, we're all familiar with the circumstances. Um, you know, how is your organization uh, on your website portraying, you know, the way that, that they're uh, responding? Is there anything special that you need to know about what's going on and how it's affecting the, your organization? Um, if you have people that if you have a situation where you have people coming into, um, you know, any kind of center or office, um, do they understand what to expect? So, you know, that can be that can be updated in some of the main sections. Um, but I think really it's just, you know, just going back to the basics, you know, uh, making sure people can easily scan your site um, and really understand what you're about. Yeah, very well said. Thank you very much, Meredith. We had this conversation with Extraordinary Charities actually last week who was looking for their, um, for next year's book, basically who they were going to add in. And, you know, sometimes we land on websites and even for us, vetting organizations, trying to fund them, not figuring out what they do. And that's a true issue. So great, great answer. Thank you very much. Okay. This next one is for you, Erica. Everyone is impacted by the pandemic. How should nonprofits be talking to their supporters through social media in light of the struggles we all share? 
Yeah. So I think it's, you know, it sounds so simple, but I think the way that you always do authentic, authentically, you know, I always say that authenticity is so important in any of your marketing message. Um, you know, don't try to be something that you're not. And, you know, don't try to, you know, put the smoke and mirrors up. If your organization is struggling because of COVID right now, because you have, you know, an influx of people in the community needing your services and it's above and beyond what you're used to handling for capacity. Um, talk about that. If things are going really well, you know, and you're getting all these donations and getting a lot of support, thank people and attribute that success to the people that are helping you navigate COVID. Um, if everything's kind of okay for your organization, but you're still facing the same kind of challenges of our staff trying to work from home and these other things are going on, you know, you can talk about that. You can be honest and, and be human. Um, I think a lot of times all marketing, but especially social media, it, people tend to think of it almost like television. Like this is my billboard and I'm going to tell you what is going on when really it's a telephone. It's a two-way conversation. You know, you should be engaging with your supporters as well. If they're leaving you a nice comment, you should be responding and asking them open-ended questions to get them to continue talking to you. Um, so it's the same type of strategies you always do. Be authentic, but also, you know, if you're facing struggles, tell your donors and your supporters. They probably want to know and help you. And if you're you know, not facing necessarily financial struggles or capacity struggles or over service, you know, too many people needing your services. If you're not facing those struggles, it's great, but you probably have other ones going on too and you can still relate in a human way, even if it's a funny Instagram reel about how quarantine is going for your team or for the people that you serve. Um, you know, just be real. It doesn't have to be this really beautiful billboard that people are seeing on the side of the road and making a judgment on. It's a conversation. That's a great answer. Thank you very much, Erica. Social media has definitely given us that opportunity to be real with each other. There's a great question that came through from Stefan, um, who sent this to us in the chat, and I'm going to read it to you, and you'll let me know who feels they want to answer, or maybe you can all chime in. Um, I'll read it to you. So I'm interested in hearing all of your opinions on the issue of oversaturation of virtual communication and fundraising. As much as virtual activities expand the reach of an organization, it also increases the competition for attention as well, as seems to lead to the public feeling overwhelmed. Cheryl. <laughs> Unmute. I read that and something instantly came to mind. First off, um, before we uh, got on this call, we were all discussing internally what happens when we see certain um, certain fundraising efforts that make us feel sad and overwhelmed and like we can't do anything about it and that we prefer things that are more positive. So that's that's one thing that I had an immediate reaction to. But the other thing is that, um, and it goes back to what Eric was just talking about, about being real and being honest. Um, Laura and I recently worked on a project for a client where we sort of like addressed a situation head on rather than skirting it. And it, it was for a client that um, it was for Resource Depot and they do, um, you know, a lot of reuse and, and recycle materials. And so we were developing this case for support and it was all, like we said on the front cover of it, this is not a waste of money and paper. Because a lot of people will look at that and say, but wait, you're a reuse recycle place. Why are you doing this? So we just decided to take the approach and head it off right away. I feel like it's okay to reach out to people and acknowledge, we know you're getting bombarded. We know lots of people are asking you for money or to attend your events. And sometimes this may or may not be the right cause for you. Like we all want to help all these causes, but it's not realistic and nobody expects you to donate to every cause. We have to pick and choose. And I just feel like sort of being positive about it and also just acknowledging that we're all being bombarded with a lot of asks and just appreciate what what we're all getting, um, you know, the volume on a daily basis. And then to th think that th somehow makes it more human. That's an excellent. Anybody else have any feedback? Oh, that was great, Cheryl. Thank you. Erica? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I totally agree with Cheryl, and I really love the point about, you know, even maybe your messaging is saying, hey, we know you're being bombarded right now, and just owning that, that's okay, you know, you're, 
you're not a robot, you're a human behind a cause, it's okay. Um, but I would like to add to that, you know, I hear this a lot of, you know, are we doing too much? Are we overwhelming people? Um, maybe, but you don't necessarily have to be and you don't have to lower your effort necessarily. It could be things like, are you really hyper segmenting your email list? Are your email lists targeted to who you're talking to? You know, you're probably talking to your volunteers and your regular donors really differently than somebody that's never given to you before, but is on your newsletter list. Um, so having really targeted segmented campaigns of who you're talking to and why. Um, also just in general for any of your marketing messaging, if the only time your supporters hear from you is when you want money, that's the problem. And they probably are going to be overwhelmed if you're all of a sudden hitting them up back to back to back for money. You should be talking to them all the time and it doesn't always have to be an ask. Um, we see a lot of success with thankathons, especially in this period. If people are like, oh, we feel like we, you know, our organization's good. We don't really want to be fundraising right now. We'd rather people give to the food banks or, you know, the, the shelters or whatever needs the funds. We're not it right now, but we do want to thank people for the impact and the fact that we're okay. So doing these thankathons, we've seen such success with that where literally you have messaging going out, not asking for a penny, just saying, hey, because of your past support, this is where we're at. Thank you so much. And people get to that because they feel, oh my gosh, we're making an impact. This is great. And you didn't even ask for it, right? So I think it's having a good content mix as well, not um, always just asking them for money because people can see right through that. That's pretty transparent, right? You want to give them updates, thank them, um, you know, show empathy and, and get empathy back. So I totally agree with Cheryl, but I would also say, you know, mix up not only your messaging, but also segment it to people. Know who you're talking to and why. Um, one size does not fit all in fundraising. Excellent. Laura, you want to chime in? Those were amazingly beautiful answers. Um, and I just uh, want to build on top of that with um, some opportunities we've seen happen this year on our team. And we've even presented um, a webinar about you know, the opportunities that have come around in this this very distinct time that we're all going through, um, you know, the challenges and, you know, the, the positives that we're finding. And I really like that in the question, you know, they said, you know, organizations are recogni recognizing that, yes, it's opening up, you know, possibilities that we haven't seen before. We might have a larger reach. We might have this, but how do we really deal with, with all the fatigue that we're feeling? And so to reinforce what my colleagues have just said, um, we, we really see this about uh, being connected to our donors. And unfortunately, a lot of organizations found that, well, mm -hmm. maybe they hadn't really been able to invest their time in that before. And uh, you know, that's okay. Now it's time to get started. You know, so many folks were at a standstill. We're like, use this time to, to call in, to thank, to check on people. If, you know, if a pandemic isn't a reason for us to press restart and, you know, get human and reacquainted with the people who have supported us in the past so that we can move forward, you know, there just can't be another more definitive time for doing that. Um, and so I think that another thing we can be doing to combat just feeling like, you know, it's, it's too much information all the time is again, you know, what are you saying? And are you helping your audiences understand your relevance? You know, they might've understood your relevance before, how are you being relevant today in this current climate? So you need to be sure that, that you're sharing that with them. How have you been adapting? How have you been meeting need? Even if you are an arts organization that's in one of the toughest positions, we are hearing the most amazing stories about how these centers are becoming a much needed hub in the community for all the things that we're missing in each other and about being together and about needing inspiration. So 
tell your donors, you know, how you're reimagining your mission right now, because so many of us have had to do that. You know, what have you responded to and what are you learning? So sharing all of that is a new way of speaking and a new way of re-engaging that I think affirms to our donors and our community that we are doing good, relevant work right now, and it's worth your time and support to stay engaged with us. So that might give you a little more clarity about how to keep messaging the right things in, in a time where we are a little tired of being talked to all the time. Beautifully said. Thank you very much, ladies, um, all three of you. I will say this quickly as a fun, from a funding perspective, I think that partnerships also give room for new content, new relevance, and even sustainability and filling needs that we may not see otherwise. And it really grabs our attention from a donor perspective in differentiation. So, no two cents even though I'm not a panelist. Um, I do have one really quick question. We had started with Surreal in regards to research, and I was wondering if any of the participants have done any research recently that they would like to talk about or share. I was um, curious, wanted to just circle back on that because I think it's the basis of everything that we've talked to so about so far anyways. So feel free to raise your hand or comment in the chat. And uh, Stefan, you're welcome. That was a great question. Um, I have one question for Meredith, actually. Um, we always talk about storytelling and making things more personal. What are some of the ways we can update our homepage to incorporate storytelling? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I, I think that in terms from just a, you know, like I, I look at the site as, as a, you know, uh, is two parts. You, know, you have your content, your information, and then you have your visuals, and they really have to kind of work together to, uh, you know, I think successfully tell your story. Um, so, you know, that starts with from a visual aspect. We can look at like the imagery that we have on our our um, homepage or our website in general. So, is our imagery authentic to our organization, to the people that we serve. Um, you know, sometimes because, you know, for a number of reasons we need to, you know, dip into stock photography. Um, but, you know, are, are we finding, it's, it's, it's a challenge, I know. Um, I have to source stock photography every day, but looking for stock photography that um, doesn't necessarily look like stock photography. Um, there's kind of like this joke about, you know, the women eating salad, smiling, you know, like there are these, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of typical, I mean, sometimes it's so funny because, um, you know, I'll, I'll see stock photography and marketing and advertising and I'm like, oh, I know that was page one of the, you know, whatever search that I do. I and mean, I've seen it multiple times. So, you know, maybe get past page three once in a while if you need to. Um, making sure just that I think visually, first of all, our homepage tells our story. If it's authentic, we can do that with imagery. Um, there's, you know, I, I, in, in my slide deck. There, I have a number of resources where you can get really nice free um, stock imagery. Uh, certainly video. I mean, that's really a, a big trend right now. If you have the ability um, and if you have you know, any video uh, that your organization has produced, um, that's fantastic to be able to add. I mean, video really tells the real story, right? It's moving pictures. Um, and we know a lot of website users um, rely on video now uh, more than ever. Um, and then just going back to that, you know, scannability, um, we certainly want to have copy that supports the visual messaging and, um, you know, really supports all the other messaging that you're doing um, online or, you know, wherever it is, that, you know, that that you know your your website really should be aligned and supporting all of your messaging in one place. Um, so I think you know, as the other panelists had mentioned in the last question, I think right now is a great time to be able to really take a step back and look at you know what kind of storytelling you're doing um, on your site. Uh, you know, there's certainly a struggle, but you know I think people are looking to see the impact that that everyone can make right now. Super. Thank you very much, Meredith. Very helpful. Um, we do have a question for the audience, and you can just simply answer in the chat to make it easy. How many of you would consider attending a virtual event because you finished Netflix? Um, if you don't mind weighing in on the chat, that would be very helpful for us. 
And we, um, in response to the question that I had asked um, about research, we are getting a little bit more information, but we do have one answer. Um, Sorrel, you were very generous in supporting a local organization in regards to uh, doing surveys and um, waiting for one more answer from him. But his original feedback is that it was a useful tool to measure the temperature among both the people who already support us and those who don't. And I think that that's vital, basically. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add to that? Are you asking me or are you asking Stefan? Sorry, no, you, I, I'm gonna wait. Well, Stefan just answered. One of the key findings is that people are attracted to different programs we do. So I think that that's key in the messaging. Would you agree? Yeah, that that supports the conversation we had earlier about segmenting your lists and crafting different messages. And I also want to say something in response to the comment about a thankathon, which I think is really brilliant. When you do a survey, um, you're actually engaging in a conversation with your donors and your potential donors. You could think of it as a thinkathon. So people like to be asked what they think. Um, so if you're doing it, just sometimes asking people what they think and what they're thinking about leads them to make a contribution like some have experienced without even asking. So That's amazing, amazing feedback. And it also makes it more inclusive, right? You're asking for feedback so people feel like they have something. It's brilliant. Love it. Absolutely. And Carolyn, if I can, uh, while we're on the research topic, there's something I wanted to mention that was a tool. I just having the benefit of such great team members. Um, I did I didn't know much about research. I still don't. Sorrel's definitely the expert. But um, one of the things she helped me work with um, for our clients this year is understanding how surveys can help you direct your focus related to your budget and where your money needs to go this year. And so one of the things um, we have suggested is for those organizations who are having to make a lot of really tough decisions about, you know, where should I absolutely keep my program dollars focused for the end of the year and into next year? Are there any we need to scale back on? Or maybe, you know, if you're unfortunately in the position where you think, do I have to let a program go? It's working with surveys and getting these thoughts. Um, and through very simple questions, you can kind of find out the programs that are, are most attractive to your donors. And so it helps you think, okay, in our fundraising plan, we're most likely to still see a certain amount of dollars come in for X, Y, and Z programs. And so it becomes a tool to help you um, make a plan for your budget when you really know what your donors are more most likely to give to among your services. So that's a very strong, strong use of surveys. That's a great, thank you for weighing in. Very, very helpful. Um, wonderful. So one more question that just came through, um, and I will let you answer whoever feels like weighing in. How do we convince our board to invest in research? Key question. Well, I can take that one first. Um, you can convince your board because if you are able to report to them the return on that investment and show them that it a saved time, saved money, uh, brought in new dollars, they, they'll have a lot more buy-in. It's, you know, marketing and market research are always the last, they're always the first things to get cut. Um, and they should always be the last things to get cut because you can't really do your job unless you're informed. Um, and that's, that's part of it. Can I add something to that? Um, so this is, I feel like the word research sometimes is like maybe misconstrued or not understood. And so a lot of times you hear research and it's sort of like, how does that relate to a fundraising project or a marketing project or a branding project or what people think about our organization? A lot of times I think research is thought of as, you know, either medical research or science research or, you know, Nielsen ratings, like who's watching what, but um, I think, you know, 
by us as marketing and branding, um, you know, and web and social media experts, it's sort of our job to, and Laura alluded to it before, we didn't know that much about research until we started working with Sorrel and saw how important it is that if you take that time and do that little bit of investment up front, how targeted and specific you can be in your efforts. It's just sort of rethinking the term research and applying it to the kind of work that we're doing and letting people know how important it is. And Cheryl, to like, I think I have a couple of very easy sentences that answer that question as well. Just walk into your board and present them with a question to say, do we want to make uninformed decisions or do we want to make informed decisions? Do we want to plan next year on guesswork or do we want to plan on knowledge? It's, it's kind of boils down hopefully to be that simple. I love it. Informed decision making, 100%. I think with that, I have a question for you, Erica. I'm talking about return on investment, which I know is something that comes up all the time. Um, can you share with us what are some ways to prove return on investment for social media efforts? Yeah, so social media, that always seems to be the one that people get hung up on and worry about proving ROI on. Um, so I think before you can ever prove ROI for any marketing campaign, what is your objective? What is your goal? What are your KPIs, i.e. your key performance indicators, right? If you go back to business school, uh, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to raise awareness? If so, you're going to be looking at things like what is your reach every month? You know, what are your engagement rates? Is that growing? Um, you know, how many hours of video content are people consuming on your YouTube and your Facebook page? Um, are people messaging you back and forth? You know, that's an indicator of awareness. Um, but also you can take it a step further. If you're doing social media advertising, especially with like Facebook and Instagram and things, if you have a Facebook pixel installed and you have conversion tracking installed, you should be able to track and every single conversion that comes from your ad. You should know to the penny how much money got donated because of an ad you ran. You should know exactly how many people filled out that submission form for volunteers if that was what you were looking for. You should know how many people registered from your ad. So all of that's with Facebook pixel tracking. Um, also in general for any of your digital marketing efforts, you should be using tracking links and, and everything should be trackable. You know, you should be looking at your Google Analytics and you should see where all your traffic is coming from. Um, you should use Google URL campaign builder uh, to know, you know, hey, this many hits this month came from our newsletter on MailChimp and you know, these many hits came from Twitter and these many, this many came from LinkedIn because we had our board share something. You should know what's going on on your website and with your fundraising efforts based on what you're doing digitally. So, you know, to prove ROI, it's, well, what are you trying to measure? You know, that's step one. What are you trying to measure? And then, you know, figuring out what metrics are going to give you data about that measurement. Excellent. Thank you very much, Erica. <laughs> I do have one question for you, Cheryl, just because the, this 2020 has been just strange for so many of us on different levels, um, including nonprofit organizations. Uh, for many, a rebrand is something that seems very overwhelming. Where do you suggest they start if they're thinking about it or having this conversation? Really good question. <clears throat> Um, so the thought of a rebrand, I completely understand to a lot of people, it can be very overwhelming. Um, the first step is understanding why you would want to rebrand. Um, and then if you feel like you need to rebrand, why? And I'm certainly happy to talk to people about that and talk you through it. Um, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. When we work with clients, we always like to say, it's actually fun. It's a big, um, it's, it's work, it's work for us and it's work for the client because we're gonna expect a lot from you. Like we're gonna expect you to dig down deep and figure out who you are and who you're trying to get in front of and who your audiences are and what's your perception. And a lot of that ends up having to do with research too. How do people perceive you? Um, but it doesn't have to be, um, you have to make a commitment 
Um, I'm not going to say it's just like easy and it happens in a week. You do need to make a commitment and you need to want to do it. But having said that, it's such a great exercise for an organization because you're going to get more clear on your mission. You're going to get more clear on who you are. And then you're going to have something that you love to turn out to the public and you know, yell from the rooftops who you are and you're so proud to hand out your business card or direct people to your website or, you know, create those social media images with your brand that really says exactly who you are. We also have um, some tools, the readiness assessment that helps organizations really determine if they're ready for a rebrand or a refresh. Thanks, Sarah, you're right, right. yep. And Terrell, I was actually going to ask you, I'm sure that ties in directly with research as well, finding out whether it's from your board and the people you serve and your donors, if there's anything that they wish to be seeing. Or, so great. Thank you for that team effort. Um, I, um, one more question that just came through, sorry. So the question is, how do we talk about ourselves in a world where our cause may not seem as important because there is so much suffering right now? Anybody care to take a... <laughs> I'll hop in for I'll that one, it. but... Oh, oh, go ahead, yeah. Erica. And would yeah. you mind repeating it one more time, Ann Carolyn? Of course. And then Erica, go. <laughs> and then you can go next, no problem. You can uh, go next. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> the question was, how do we talk about ourselves in a world where our cause may not seem as important because there is so much suffering now? Yeah, so I think, you know, that kind of goes back just to even life, right? Just because somebody may be worse off than you doesn't mitigate or mean that you don't also have difficult things that you're experiencing in your life. And I think the same thing is for, you know, your cause. Um, sure, there may be other causes that are dealing with issues that may seem more extreme or devastating or things, but that doesn't mean there isn't a place in the community that for your organization and what you're doing and, and what you care about. Um, and just like with anything else, if you care about it, there's probably other people out there that care about it too. So I think, again, it's just going back to being really authentic, you know, and be honest, you know, don't try to say overstate what you do or try to make it sound, you know, fantastical and <laughs> don't overextend, you know, or over explain what you're doing. Be honest, you know, don't overstate, you know, if you're not doing something in response to COVID, don't try to imply that you are, right? Um, but it's also okay to continue to, to care about what you care about for your mission and, and be authentic about that and talk about the problems. It's not really a comparison. I think what's so great about the nonprofit community, especially here in Palm Beach County, but all over is, you know, addressing different needs within our community um, in real time. So I don't know that it's one's more important than the other. We're all working together to have a better community. So talk about that. You, you have a place too. Excellent. Thank you, Erica. Laura? Erica spoke, spoke to it so well, so there's not much to add. But, but again, just um, it, a reminder that um, it's the time when organizations are re, they're either reimagining um, what they're going to become, you know, in relation to a world that is dealing with so much uh, trauma and pain, or they are doubling down on who they are and who they want to be in the community. And so it's really an excellent time to evaluate what you are to the community. Do you need to make some changes? Do you need to work on accessibility? Um, if you're feeling like maybe you're not as relevant, you know, on the scale of where your services are compared to those, you know, like first responder types of causes, um, there are ways to help you uh, increase the awareness and the understanding for the value that you're bringing. So I would say, again, make sure that, that you are assessing and speaking to the value that you're providing. And it's not gonna be meaningful for everyone, but, but that's the point of causes. And that's the point of what we do in charitable work is most of us 
uh, formed and became who we are because we have a certain aspect of society that we are working to meet. And just because perhaps your cause is not the one that is putting out all the fires right now, thank God you're still in place and taking care of the need because it hasn't gone away. So I would just say again, in your messaging, relay that value as much as you can and make sure that people are feeling um, welcomed by you, um, that you're approachable, uh, and that um, the help that you're providing is easy to get to and easy to receive. Excellent. Thank you very much, Laura. And I don't know if you, um, as I mean, ladies will agree, Clay, you're not excluded from this. <laughs> um, I think that there's also a direct impact of COVID, which is what we've been, you know, seeing agencies struggle to deal with right now, but there are secondary impacts such as mental health. And I think that we will see more and more in the weeks and months to come, the need for cultural organizations to step up and give people an avenue to help. And I think that that can be part as well, just we have to stay focused, of course, in the immediate, we had to fix immediate needs that were on the forefront, but I think that there's gonna be a trickling effect and we're gonna see that every agency is gonna play its role and, and thankfully, you know, hopefully they make it through. So I think that that's part of it as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know that somebody asked for the link to the ready, readiness assessment. Um, we will share that with everyone in a follow-up email. So thank you for asking. Um, I think I'm gonna throw all of you just out there. Um, is there one word of wisdom that you'd like to share with every participant this morning? I think my new motto for this year is resilience. I think I'm just gonna put it right there. Um, in regards to nonprofits, I, I've been blown away by the resilience that's been shown. Um, the teamwork uh, in response to COVID-19. So that's my word of wisdom. Um, Soral, do you have anything that you'd like to share? Or if you have any other questions that keep coming up for you? I'm telling you, I put you on the spot, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really have any final wrap-up thoughts. I think this was a, a, a really uh, thoughtful conversation all the way around. Excellent. Thank you very much. Cheryl, go ahead. So it's funny that you say that. I don't know if you guys can see in back of me on my board, it says joy. Um, and so at the beginning of the, at the very end of last year, I decided that this year, my word was going to be joy. And man, that was a challenging word for this year, right? How naive I was in on January 1st. Um, so it's been a super big challenge, but the other day I actually wrote it again on my board because I decided that, you know, we've all just been trying to find a little bit of joy in this year. And that goes to kind of what I was saying earlier about like in fundraising, like don't make it all doom and gloom. Like, let's try to focus on the good stuff and the joy that we have found in this year and just acknowledge like it, this year has sucked totally sucked. But I bet if we asked every single person that's on this attendee list to say, to find one thing of joy that's happened for them during the pandemic, they could easily call up something to mind. I love it. And Katrina just commented, yes, joy in spite of, I love it. it it's so true. And, and Jennifer just commented to teamwork, which goes, brings so much joy, truly. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Ooh and family time together, love it. Um, if I can hop in here, um, I've said it several times today, but the word reimagine just keeps, keeps coming up for me because um, uh, again, in the work um, that we've been privileged to do this year, despite the craziness, we have never seen more creative, more heartfelt, more, innovative ways that people are making great opportunities happen and reaching beyond everything they ever thought was possible to help meet need. And um, I've been constantly inspired by that. And a lot of people have just said, you know what, a enough with, with the usual BS that has always been a distraction and kept us away from what we really wanted to do, we get to push reset. So 
you know, in some ways there have been joyous gifts that have been a result of this time that that has, you know, just flummoxed us all. But um, the reimagining and the repurpose that is going on is astounding. It's, it's been a beautiful thing to see. So just reimagine. I absolutely love it. And that kind of goes with, with uh, what Jennifer just commented, thinking outside the box. And Stefan just said, in difficulty lies opportunity. And so rather than looking at 2020 as a lost year, look for all the good things that we can extract from it. Cheers. I love it. Absolutely. Erica, do you want to go? Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> um, I think for me, you know, I love the, the positive angles and some of the things I heard, you know, Laura and Cheryl say, it really reminds me of a really great quote from Jamie Tarkowski. He founded Trait Love and Harms, which is a nonprofit I really love that started out in Central Florida. Um, but he had this really great tweet about, you know, conversations won't be canceled, relationships won't be canceled. It's a long laundry list of things that aren't canceled. Let's lean into the good that remains. So I really do love that. And that's a good reminder. But I think for me this year, you know, sort of my advice to my clients and my nonprofit friends, but also myself and my real network of relationships and friendships, um, you know, you can't be everything to everyone and you're not a robot. You know, this is a tough year. There's a lot going on. People working from home, homeschooling kids. Um, you know, you're not doing your normal activities. You know, for me, it was yoga. Yoga was my thing. And, you know, I still now I'm doing it in my bathroom and my life is different. And I really just miss my yoga. Um, but we're having to find ways to cope. And, you know, you're not a robot. Some days you're going to feel like you can take on the world and do everything on your fundraising to-do list and you've got it. And other days you're going to feel a little drained and that's okay. Give yourself space to be a human um, and give your supporters and team members space to be human too. We're all in this together and we're all just trying to get by. Um, so that's kind of my advice. And, and when you're talking about digital marketing specifically too, you know, look at what you can actually accomplish. You know, don't try to do everything if you can't. If you're a team of one, pick two or three things that like you need to focus on and do those things really well instead of spinning your wheels and being a little Tasmanian devil running around, but you're not getting anything done. You're just spinning your wheels up. That's not really productive. So just accept what is, accept what you can do and try to do that as best as you can, you know? So that's me. <laughs> Beautifully said, Erica. And I will chime in to say that I remember one or two times this summer emailing you and being like, I am just this whole social media thing. There's too much negativity. I can't take it. And you being like, okay, listen, step back, take the weekend, shut the computer, breathe. And I think that that's really important. I think sometimes we try to do so much that it's important to have support groups tell you, girlfriend, don't stop or friend, whatever. Just be okay with yeah. stuff back and taking time to breathe and you will look back and you, you know in a couple of days and feel so much more energized and positive and so thank you for that Erica I've been trying to live by it so <laughs> Meredith it's hard but I I do it too so you have to <laughs> absolutely well Erica stole mine so I will follow up with <laughs> um, I would say like self-care self-care for ourselves our families um, checking in on our friends and, you know, from a professional standpoint, self-care for, you know, the people we serve, um, you know, putting, you know, knowing that, you know, you have to put that oxygen mask on yourself um, in the different segments that, you know, different segments of your life, whether it's personal or professional. Um, and, and, you know, I think that I've got, I've got a dog, guys, I got a dog and a, and a crew here, but I'll leave it at that. I think it's just taking care of one another. It's beautifully said, and actually we had comments um, from our participants, um, Jennifer, that said, you know, time management is important, work-life balance, 100%. And Christine Raymond from Extraordinary Charities, hello. Uh, yep, self-care is everything right now. So I think um, we all agree on that. So I want to say thank you from our lovely dream team, Sorrel, Cheryl, and uh, Laura. You were um, amazing, insightful, and, and truly had great content and great feedback. And um, from Achieve, Meredith, Erica, and Clay behind the scenes. This was really, really insightful. Um, Clay just posted in the chat for everyone to see. If you're trying to reach um, any of our panelists with questions, 
he actually uh, shared the Dream Team and Achieves website. So please feel free to reach out to them. And uh, it was an honor being here with you this morning. Anything else that I may be missing, Clay? No, that's great. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, helping us out today, Anne, and leading this discussion. So I want to thank all the panelists for all your hard work and your respective webinars that you put on and joining us today and everyone who's attending. And I hope uh, this was really helpful to everyone. And uh, we hope to do this again real soon. So. Absolutely. Will you follow up with a link to everyone, to all the webinars? Because I missed a couple and I actually would love to catch up with that way better than Netflix to answer your that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. This is, the joke in our house is we finished Netflix a couple of weeks ago and we're desperate for more entertainment. So yeah. I'm looking uh, to you for my next entertainment, if you don't mind. <laughs> you so thank you very much, honestly. Yeah. For, thank you for yeah. doing such a great job moderating. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank and you. Carolyn, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks, Thanks participants. Much. Keep up the good work. Absolutely. Yeah.